So good morning, friends. Uh, Pat has already introduced, uh, given introduction for this program. This is uh, one of the national symposia, and uh, there are six such programs happening in this conference. And this is cataract surgery in 2020, new uh, fecromal subluxation surgery, new frontiers. So we start off with, good morning, Dr. Namrata. We start off with the first uh, presentation of the day, Dr. Anand Parsarthi, and his topic is technology for pre-surgical IL calculations, usual and the unusual. Over to you, Pat. Uh, thank you, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the scientific committee for inviting us here. Uh, my topic is on pre-operative measurements to get perfect outcomes, the usual and the unusual. And uh, I would acknowledge uh, Dr. Purnima's uh, co contributions for this presentation uh, as well. No financial interest. Uh, this is uh, one of our patients, 61-year-old uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, with a Schirmer's of one millimeter and a very significant ocular surface disease. And patients like these uh, definitely affect uh, your preoperative measurements. And there's a slight story behind this patient. He's a bi uh, he was also a biochemist, and uh, he had a history of undergoing PI, uh, also complained of dry eyes. And he said, doctor, whenever I cry, I don't get tears. And I said, why is that? And he said, I've been married for 25 years. I said, I can understand I've been married for 14. Uh, but we, this patient finally uh, did get a punctal plug and we were able to get fairly good uh, keratometry results uh, and then plan for surgery. Uh, as you can see, a post uh, uh, plug patient. Uh, the other patient, one other example, a 31 year old uh, lady unhappy with uh, vision, underwent IO surgery about 10 years back uh, and of course, an important point in history was uh, the husband was a local counselor and uh, was not very keen on uh, surgical intervention. Uh, and we did find that uh, the p lens was actually placed in the sulcus uh, and on further uh, testing, we did find that this patient uh, actually uh, was a nanophthalmo uh, with an axial length of about 16 in both eyes uh, with fairly steep corneas. Uh, and for, hi for her, uh, we had to actually do a fair bit of planning in terms of uh, removing the first uh, eye. Could you reduce the volume? Reduce the volume. Switch it off. So we actually dissected uh, the anterior and the posterior capsule. Uh, and since we didn't know the IOL power for this patient, uh, we did uh, a bit of calculation in terms of removal of the first IOL and implantation of the second. And we put the planned IOL uh, in the bag and then uh, reinserted the first IOL. And we were actually uh, fairly presently surprised that uh, we had a fairly good post-operative result. And this was one other patient uh, that our optometry was actually able to uh, get good results. Now, in getting perfect results, I think there is no longer any utopia. It's fairly common to get uh, good vision if you've done your planning, like this patient who was uh, in our OPD about a week back with uncorrected 6x6 N6 post surgery. Uh, of course, there are some critical factors in, in achieving perfect outcomes in the present uh, era where you have good repeatable measurements for ketometry, axial length, and that is probably one bugbear which we've actually not been able to crack is effective lens position because uh, that is almost a variable component, varies with patient systemic factors uh, and occasional capsular phimosis, uh, like in this patient who had uh, uncontrolled diabetes, came back with a very significant refractive surprise a month later, and we had to actually uh, go and reopen the tunnel uh, and then uh, release the phimosis, and his refractive error then came back. Uh, Keratometry and axial length uh, in terms of patient cooperation are probably more important for uh, optical biometers than for uh, the standard biometers. Uh, in terms of keratometry measurement, which is important yeah, in uh, what I call normal virgin corneas, uh, there is actually fairly good agreement uh, between IOL master, IOL 500, 700, even shine plug imaging, which is considered the gold standard for keratometric measurements. Vis-a-vis -vis the prominent measurements of K1, K2, uh, the mean K, and astigmatic measurements. Very occasionally, you do need to take into account posterior corneal measurements, but that is more probably for abnormal corneas. When you get the total corneal power, which is now probably available with the Barrett, you, your, your requirement for having additional measurements is, is less critical. An, uh, another study which did say there's no clinical significant difference between almost all these measurements with respect to axial length 
mean K and antechamber depth. And this is important because now you can get repeatable measurements with uh, which is fairly um, uh, independent of the person doing it. And that is important when you are do not have the time to do these measurements for each and every patient uh, that you have. Uh, that is also a good study which mentioned that there is high comparable bet between almost all machines which are now available, in including the newer ones like the Cassini uh, in normal virgin cornea. So we have sorted that out in terms of what is required for uh, ketometry measurements. However, there is uh, now fairly good evidence, not much though, uh, on trying to solve the conundrum with complex corneas. Uh, it is known that uh, diseases that alter the posterior cornea curvature like ectasia, post-refractive uh, surgery, uh, do have slight errors in measurement because the concept of measurement for these uh, machines are not good. Uh, and you need to then look at the total uh, true corneal power, which occasionally, if not measured properly, gives uh, result, uh, erroneous results in calculating the IOB power. In fact, even in shine plug measurements, the, the SIMK tends to overestimate the total corneal refractive power, especially in advanced keratoconus, and this discrepancy proves to be a source of hyperopic refractive error after surgery. Uh, in this patient who, who we operated uh, and is post-RK, you can make out in the red glow, uh, we did do multiple measurements before we actually went ahead with uh, the surgery, uh, and you need to confirm this across uh, at least two or three machines, and this is an important uh, area where you can get uh, slight discrepancies. Uh, a commonly asked question is, do you actually need an optical biometer? And almost 95% of probably Indian ophthalmologists who practice do not use optical biometers as routine. And it is now fairly well proven that immersion biometry gives comparable results to optical biometry and gives predictable results if you have the input data in terms of uh, K1, K2 fairly uh, confirmed. Uh, there are, of course, newer machines which have an all-in-one biometer, uh, which gives reliable and reproducible measurements across the factors of K, axial length, and anterior chamber depth, and most of them now also give white-to-white. -white, uh, and maybe for probably challenging uh, cataract surgeries, unusual high myopes, post-refractive surgery, even for that post uh, keratoplasties, it may be a worthwhile investment if your volume of practice for those kind of corneas are more. Uh, of course, there are some advantages in terms of non-contact shorter wavelength, which measures the axial length more precisely, uh, and scans along uh, the visual axis. This is important when you have patients with staphyloma, which can be a source of uh, undercorrection. Uh, also important that ultrasound biometry measures only till the uh, interlimiting membrane, and the additional 200 microns with the optical biometer may be a small source of error as well. Uh, remember, this is not affected by uh, IOL material in, in uh, sudafix or uh, fake, um, silicon oil. Uh, is there a difference between technology of what is not commonly used, which is a partial coherence interferometry, uh, compared to the swept source? Probably for majority of the cataracts which are early, it may not really make a big difference. But for advanced cataracts where you need to make sure that you have good penetration, uh, it is uh, the partial PCI-based optical biometer may not be ideal because it is unable to measure uh, axial lengths in dense uh, or diffuse subcapsular cataracts. And in fact, there's been one study which mentioned that uh, the failure rates are almost close to 30 plus percent. The present new kit on the block of uh, swept source based optical uh, uh, to, uh, biometers, which is SSOT OCT, uh, seems to have slightly better results. There are only, uh, as far as I know, two Indian uh, markets, uh, two machines in the Indian market and both seem to have fairly good penetration in grade four, even five uh, cataracts. Uh, this is also an important part because it can confirm the line of the scan occasionally through the fovea, uh, and this, this does give uh, significant advantages in slightly difficult eyes. Uh, in terms of IOL power, which is an important part of uh, measuring your preoperative plan, uh, I think generation one and generation two IOL formulas are no longer uh, preferable. I think grade uh, the generation three, and if you have access, generation four, and a lot of these formulas are now available online and free of cost, uh, which are uh, probably more accurate for majority of the cases. In fact, I think the predictability, present predictability as per studies is more than plus 90 plus percent uh, if you've got uh, the 
keratometry, the axial length measurements, uh, and uh, the owl power correc correction done. Uh, this is a fairly recent slide, and this has changed over the last maybe 10 to 15 years in terms of the accuracy range for commonly used formulas by axial length. And uh, in fact, if you look at accuracy across short, normal, and long axial length, uh, I think the Hill RBF and Barrett's uh, 2K are actually preferred probably now the present gold standard, and that's something that I would uh, definitely recommend. Uh, a last a couple of points about cataract surgery in endothelial disease, uh, which can defi definitely affect your surgical plan, uh, since I do have a fairly uh, large cornea practice. Uh, and this was a patient with fuchs dystrophy, and you can make out uh, the endothelial uh, guttate. And when you're actually combining these with uh, 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 endothelial keratoplasty, remember that you would definitely need to uh, uh, probably overcorrect by about a diopter, diopter and a half. Uh, in conclusion, there are multiple factors that affect outcomes. Uh, repeatable measurements to ensure good visual outcomes uh, in the normal range of K and axial length is now uh, fairly predictable. Unusual corneal topo topo uh, topography can definitely affect calculations and needs to be confirmed on devices with more data measurements, especially for patients for ke post keratoplasty, keratoconus, or intracorneal rings. Uh, coexisting morbidities definitely require adjustments of the technique. And I thank you for the attention. Thank you, Dr. Anand, for that wonderful uh, presentation. And now I invite the next speaker, Dr. Maripal Sichti, who is going to be talking about femtosecond laser cataract surgery. Is it the new frontier for all cases? Thank you very much. Ye mic nahi chal raha. Thank you very much, Dr. Namrata, uh, Arup, Anand, and Arul. I'll be talking about uh, femtolaser assisted cataract surgery as to what are the new things that are happening in femtolaser assisted cataract surgery. Now. Uh, one particular thing is that femtolaser assisted cataract surgery does take care of the normal patients in a very good way. That means that you will be able to do femtolaser in normal cataract. But it is a question of pushing the limits <coughs> in femto cataract and that is what I am going to show you that in various circumstances why a femtolaser assisted cataract surgery has become the preferred choice. Now whenever you have seen that uh, one of the four functions of a femtolaser is to get a capsulotomy and the second function is to do a nucleotomy. Now this is actually a black cataract <coughs> and you can see that we have got a good capsulotomy. You make a slightly larger capsulotomy that is about 5.2 millimeters or 5.5 millimeters so that the hard nucleus can come out. And now you see here that there are these eight sections that have been made and just see that you are getting a good hold once you get a good hold onto this area, you can see that there is a easy dissection plus there is air bubbles that is coming out. Now this air bubble having come out means that there has been a dissection and see how easy it is to split the nucleus. If you yourself try a black cataract and try to split it, if it has not been pre-chopped by a laser, you will have problems. So in case you see uh, that uh, this is the blackness of the cataract, can you see this? It's actually a black cataract and there again there is a sectioning that has happened. So just to show you that uh, again you can see uh, uh, other parts you can see it's being removed here also very easily and the sectioning has happened. Post-op day one is great. Now what is important in this particular case is that as long as it is not a white cataract that means that the focusing mechanism of the laser is intact you will get good sectioning. So rock hard cataracts, brown cataract, it has been shown that the amount of energy that is required goes down by at least 50 to 60 percent. Therefore the collateral damage on the cornea or the chances of having iritis etc go down. Now let us see a cataract which is a traumatic cataract. Uh, we have done the capsulotomy, we are staining it now just see that this has fibrosis. Can you see this entire area which has been stained? This is a post-traumatic cataract lying in the eye for 20 years. So you can see we have a free-floating capsulotomy to here to here. You can see that there is a strand that is coming and you can see that there is a strand that is coming here. Now this is being perforated by the femto laser by a like a postage stamp and you can see that Whatever adhesions were there, we have been able to remove this. Now again, see that there is an adhesion here at the fibrotrid, this and this. So just go back from the other side. 
be a little careful and you will get a good capsulotomy. If I was to use a needle, it would not have happened in any way. I would have got a tear or an extension. So if you see, I get a good round capsulotomy. So even in fibrotic cases, you get a good round capsulotomy because you get a postage stamp perforation and you are able to do things well. Now, if you have a case of phacomorphic glaucoma and you open the eye, the moment you will open the eye, I will show you how intumescent the cataract is, you will get an Argentinian flag, flag sign. That is the biggest advantage that when you are doing a capsulotomy in femto, it is in a closed eye situation. Just, I am pausing here. Can you see the extent of the swelling up of the nucleus? Can you see the iris touching the back of the cornea? So case of phacomorphic glaucoma, now you see that the capsulotomy has started. And despite the capsulotomy having started, you will nev not get an Argentinian flag sign. You will see a huge amount. Can you see that huge amount of explosion? This is what the intralenticular pressure causes in cases that you are doing it with a needle. Now, let's. these are just incisions. I will go forward. So, as you see here, again, always use trepan blue because there, when this intralenticular fluid comes out, it can have some areas of skip. So, you see, I get a fantastic capsulotomy. Even in case of a phacomorphic glaucoma, this is a crystal lens that is being inserted. This video is about six, seven years old. Now, the next challenge is the posterior polar cataract. We have done a lot of work on it. This uh, two of our papers on this are being published in Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. What is important is that you can see that there are typical areas which if you image which you get on the OCT, you will be able to find out even on the table before you take the patient for FACO whether there is going to be a rent or not. That is what is most mo important. So I'll just show you what exactly I'm going to uh, be talking about. So this is the OCT that is happening. I'll pause at the moment you get, this is the cornea that has come into view. And now let the posterior float of the, okay, sorry. Okay, anyway, uh, when you see the posterior float of the capsule, you can see that there is a small issue, but it is not a, a big defect that is there. So you can see that in this particular case, you may not have any problem in So in this particular next case that I'll show you, in this particular case, see here, this is showing you a posterior capsular defect. Can you see this? So this is definitely, you can see there is a defect. This is definitely going to rupture. Okay, there is a pre-existing defect. So I have taken the default up and I'll just say that because we are giving a great epinuclear cushion, it is only towards the end that I will have a rupture. So you see here, good capsulotomy, uh, there is so much of uh, nuclear uh, emulsification that you don't need much, you don't do any hydro procedure because pneumo is enough and you can see that I have been able to remove the entire nucleus without even rotating it. Now once this is the last piece which I am uh, disassembling and taking out, once I take this out, you can see in this particular case, as things are moving, you can see this is going to be the defect but I have a huge in the effect, I have a huge epinuclear cushion and there is no nuclear drop. I have not had a single nuclear drop in a polar cataract once I have shifted on to flax because I know and you can see that it's only at the end of the aspiration of the cortex that this defect will appear. Just see this. Can you see this defect appearing? There is nobody who could have stopped this defect from appearing. Can you see this? But I would never get a drop. Now let me just show you the last case scenario, which is a post-traumatic. You can see this is a post-traumatic subluxation. In this particular case, it's a large subluxation, a doctor who came to me from Patna. In this particular case, we'll use everything that you have in your armamentarium, including the flax surgery, to, uh, to get a great outcome. So you can see here, there's a defect here. We're doing, the important thing is, you can still do a capsulotomy despite vitreous coming there. So I'll just show you, can, can you see this? The iris is going down. 
and you can see this blob here this is vitreous so despite vitreous being in the interior chamber you will be able to get a good capsulotomy which is not possible with a needle okay because the zonular support is not there i'll just skip this you can do a custom center you can see you can do a scanned capsule center so that when you are putting a ring and the whole thing is getting uh, position changed you can uh, have as much of a central capsulotomy this is the defect you can see we got a good capsulotomy we got a nuclear emulsification so what is happening is that the nuclear emulsification is happening so you don't have to use too much of parameters you can work on pre-cut nucleus and you have a great capsulotomy so let us just shift to the OR now what we are doing in this particular case you can see this is the huge subluxation what we will do is that we will uh, have our retina person help us by decompressing the vitreous before that is very important so you have the trocar cannula whatever vitreous is pre presenting we are taking it out so that the uh, lens iris diaphragm falls down you we are using tricot and we are doing a vitrectomy so whatever vitreous is coming out we will try to centralize the nucleus by giving it a tamponade by the lens coming in so you can see i got a great capsulotomy i'm putting an endocapsular ring now as we put in the endocapsular ring you will see that you will see that i am able to break the nucleus and once i am able to break the nucleus it is coming out very well i have decompressed you can see that i'll be able to take out everything uh, this is the epinucleus uh, ia putting in viscoelastic putting in a three piece lens and now what we will do is we'll do a vitrectomy of the vitreous which is uh, uh, which was coming out and after this we there is a tag which is there so i will just switch the uh, two sides that means i will put in the infusion from the other side you can see uh, i'm just taking it out put the infusion from here and take the cutter from the other side to cut this out and uh, therefore this is the outcome so friends this is all that i wanted to say that uh, normal cases you can keep seeing but the take home message is that femto technology i feel is the future and as technology of femto cataracts evolve it finds widespread use in complex cases normal ca cases is obviously there and i think it's the time to take a faith a leap of faith and switch over to the power of femto thank you very much for your kind attention Thank you, sir, for those uh, wonderful videos on uh, femtosecond uh, cataract surgery, which simplifies uh, the difficult cases of echoemulsification. Now I request uh, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash is there. Dr. Vasavada, Dr. Abhay Vasavada, to give his talk on premium intraocular lenses. Is cataract surgery the new refractive surgery? And the next speaker is going to be Dr. Arunmali Verman. So I think, sir, you can uh, pre uh, present from this talk. Yeah. I, I do receive research grant support from Alcon Laboratories, but has uh, uh, no relevance. Uh, and the question is, is the cataract surgery the new refractive surgery now that we have uh, so many uh, IOLs based on different optical principles helping us to uh, do that. But I just want to say that uh, refractive surgery, cataract refractive surgery is a tool and it's not end point. That refractive cataract surgery will allow you to 
produce a quality of vision with less dependence or no dependence on glasses uh, to change the quality of life and making the patient happier. So uh, it's a very important step that we take this cataract or a clear lens surgery as a refractive surgery so that we can ultimately finally will be able to achieve that game. <coughs> Other thing is that we have paid attention to the spherical defocus, ametropia 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and we, we have all the formulas dealing with, and we are very happy if we can achieve the targeted uh, spherical equivalent. But we are not paid enough attention to the astigmatic defocus. Astigmatic defocus is more lethal to the quality of image than the spherical defocus. So I think time has come now that we have mastered the spherical defocus to pay attention to this because it's really a, wait, it's not coming high, okay. Uh, it is really a problem and we found in uh, many years ago that 77% had more than 0.5 diopter of astigmatism uh, uh, in patients undergoing cataract surgery. So to me, toric eye or toricity and toric treating astigmatism is important either as a monofocal component, as a, as a multifocal component, whatever, please address the toricity or astigmatism and it's a necessity, it should be a norm. We should be asking question why we are not putting toric component in this patient rather than saying can we put the toric lens because studies have shown that even treating 0 0.5, 0 0.75 uh, is also worth the, the strain provided you go through the protocol of precision, uh, good equipments, taking time, understanding the patient and so on and there isn't the right formula, uh, the Barrett's uh, true, true K and Barrett's toric uh, calculators available free on these various websites really is a help. Now, uh, customizing the press biopic solution is something which has uh, been there for many years. We have a cornea base, we have lens base, but I'm going to address more on the IOL base, clear or cataractous lens in, in the real life uh, situations. And we have enjoyed the traditional multifocals of at Lisa, Technis, Restore Plus 3, 3.5, and many others like that, and they, they were quite okay, fairly uh, flexibility, but not a quality, uh, so there was there's a trade-off. Then in the evolution, low ads came, Symphony, Restore 2.5, Oculentis, and many, which concentrated on intermediate as well as the distance vision, and uh, having understood that you produce a good quality, but has to have a help of the reading glasses with extra lights. And then this, uh, in the recent years, trifocals with at least a physiol panoptic, which addresses intermediate as well as to some extent reading, but the reading is never their strength. But all of these will have some halos and glare. All of these will have a low contrast sensitivity, or reduced contrast sensitivity, and so on. For example, a traditional multifocal of Technis, at least are restored, all of these will have a 30, 40 centimeter reading vision and, and an acceptable distance vision, but not very good intermediate visions. And they will have uh, a, they will have the uh, negative dysphotopsias, uh, glare, and, and also will need uh, extra light and very little intermediate vision. The low ads, as I said, will concentrate more on the distance quality, is very good, and has some intermediate, m useful intermediate vision for mobile computers at 50, 60 centimeters. And you can consider that in people who are ready to accept reading glasses, but the caution is that particularly these lenses, of all lenses, will need more light because the light energy is more for distance and intermediate, so very little for reading. So. For reading glasses, they really will need an extra light, and if the person's profession is to move to different offices like marketing, he can't create extra light everywhere. So this is a negative part of it, but otherwise that's good, and you can use the technology, and we have used it to our benefit of our patients, uh, giving near and far for both, with combining traditional with low ads uh, multifocal, but the trifocal has changed now, and uh, with the help of trifocals, now we are able to, to address many patients uh, who have uh, 
motivation for not using glasses at all or very little, and we are able to do that at, uh, uh, with quite ease with majority of the folks. And the, the, the optical principle is that if you have 40 centimeter, you will have to double the length, uh, the double distance for intermediate. So uh, these lenses, uh, particularly the Zeiss and the Fiziol, have a excellent intermediate vision at 80 centimeter uh, or around that time. And that works very well for people who are in a chef or a kitchen where they have to do a, a long distance like uh, you know, cooking sort of thing. So these lenses are very good for those people who have an intermediate distance uh, focus at a little further away. The newer lens like this, people, this is very good, Fiziol and Zeiss, but the panoptics, the newer entry to this, is something a little different and uh, uh, it's not difficult to please uh, uh, ladies with any kind of multifocal because their primary interest many times is just this activity and if they can do it, they're happy. It's the man and the younger ones who are very difficult to uh, satisfy in multifocal practice in real life. But, but pan optics uh, with a shorter distance of intermediate uh, is uh, very good for people who are interested in a shorter distance uh, and uh, uh, that kind of activity. So pan optics, like the other trifocal, ha have a good comparable contrast sensitivity, but has a continuum or a seamless, excellent vision from near 30, 40 to 60, 70, or, uh, or if you have the other one with 80 centimeters, there can be a little bit of a deep at around uh, 50, 60 centimeters. But all of these lenses do great in terms of uh, meeting the needs for greater spectacle independence. But if they have a really very fine vision or a very demanding people, that is, these are not the ones. There is a compromise particularly for the reading visions. And also in the mesopic condition, they will have a reduced vision, including panoptics, including all these multifocal lenses. And they would have halos somehow with panoptics, it seems, although there is, I don't know there is uh, any logical explanation, the halos appears to be a little less bothering. They are there, but they don't bother as much as they do with some other lenses. But whatever that is, this is the, situation, but but uh, but to really do well and to kind of uh, be more successful and satisfying for the patients, you really need to pay attention to the precision and have the right equipments and treat the astigmatism, uh, as I, I, I said earlier, and be careful with the aberration profile, corneal profile, eye profile in general, OCTs, and also there's something which has not been, uh, uh, been used as much as it should be by cataract surgeons. Uh, we found in a study we published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology that uh, significant of patients were seen by retinal people with, with normal ophthalmological fundus who had a sufficient 18% in all abnormality degrading the quality of the vision and making the patients unhappy. But enough chair time counseling and giving uh, the negative aspects of all the lenses that you're going to use uh, for refractive cataract surgery and customizing it for individual patients is something very useful. Uh, have I any time? No? Yes. All right. This is a 43 years old uh, uh, doctor with uh, postipolar cataracts in uh, both eyes had a a significant astigmatism in each eye, and he, like us, has a microscopic and dental chair, and he, he doesn't like wearing glasses. And uh, we, could, we could handle him with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the mix and match at that time, um, traditional versus low ad. But this is something I would uh, uh, show last case, uh, a, a 52 years diabetic person, a very important uh, yeah, socially and uh, in charge of a good company and always had the astigmatic glasses uh, until now and uh, we, we suggested trifocal lens and this is what she ended up unaided with both eyes with good intermediate and uh, good thing. Can, can you hear this? Yes. There is an audio. So brightness may be aapko comfortably dikh raha hai. Volume. Yes. Volume. Yeah, no? Because volume. these are focus lights, like a headlight. Increase the volume, please. I can't H Z. Mm -hmm. I don't see it because. And are you?
you seeing any rings around the light? As in rings, so nahi hai. But ha, huh, if like uh, if I'm sitting in the car or something, say, oh, I mean, it's a little bit like this. How visually disabled? How disabling is it in terms of if you look at the talk of the disablement? How disabling is it? Very disabling or just sort of? Sort of. Not really. No. You can drive with that. I can. If you are going to ask me to drive in this, I can drive with that. You can drive with this. Yes. All right. All right. Acha. Hindi. Chai se pehli motiya karwa kar chashme ke shishye badalne dene chahiye. Prati vash aankho ki parisha ko haath bho kar dalna chahiye. Purani dawa ko prayog me nahi lana chahiye. Bacho ko khelne ke liye no blood. Need to wear uh, glasses. You feel the need to wear glasses now for any fine no. work? Not at all. Not, not, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. That's, that's I can write very well. I can read very well. I have no problems. I think uh, the point is that with this cataract refractive surgery, uh, we are able to uh, make patients more happier than earlier. But there will be patients where we have to avoid putting these multifocal lenses if their ocular profile is not good their corneal profile their their hobbies and their demands are such that you need to be very careful thank you so very much thank you sir for those uh, practical tips on uh, cataract refractive surgery and now uh, i invite uh, dr arul mozi berman to give his talk on make in india machines and lenses how do they compare with their foreign counterparts i think another uh, another uh, question which needs to be answered uh, and from none other than dr arul muzi varman good morning so my talk is going to be on the indian products in the cataract surgery armamentarium it would have been very apt if Rohit had spoken before me about the advancements in FACO and IOLs been already covered by Dr. Rasauda. So that would have covered it further, but unfortunately Rohit is not here. Let me take you through what can we expect or what are we getting from the Indian companies vis-a-vis -vis the machines and the IOLs. Do they meet our aspirations or do they meet the standards set globally? We all understand that FACO emulsification has become a mature technology. The technology and the production itself has become very accepted and precise. And it's been well adapted and innovated by our Indian manufacturers. We have probably the lightest handpiece in the world is manufactured by Indian manufacturer. Every manufacturer worth the salt in India or abroad can give you micro pulsed energy, which was one of the major advancements that made FACO very, very safe for the cornea. We need to have highly sensitive sensors which will sense the change in the IOP internally inside the eye, fluctuations of chamber and take adaptive measures. We need smart pumps with low inertia to give you best results. And we need outstanding software. Where to go for software? Where else from India? So put all this together, we have some very good in machines in India. So just to show, this is an uh, Indian made machine, which is using a positive fed, non-gravity fed infusion. In other words, it's the same as what comes on the Alcon Centurion, which is called uh, the uh, adaptive or the active fluidics. So please watch. It's a fairly hard cataract. Look at the chamber stability. Look at the lack of any kind of chatter, the ease of chop, in spite of the cataract being pretty hard. And watch the way that this, observe that this has got no bag. The bag is internal. See the stability of the chamber. absolute lack of any kind of chatter. The piece stays stuck and does not move away and does not float around in the anterior chamber, does not cause any turbulence. So this is the quality of a product that's made in India. With the latest technology, we all look at the active fluidics as something that is the highest technology in uh, fake emulsification today. So. There you have absolutely precise, no chatter, no chamber collapse, no fluctuation. So that puts into a nutshell 
what you can get out of an Indian made Seiko emulsification machine a top end performance that you would see at a cost which is about half a crore and this machine would cost you much lesser again no financial interest in any of these uh, uh, material I'm talking about and I oils Indian manufacturers have been making I oils for more than 35 years we've seen the PMMA I oils that came in uh, NaO its solution in a bottle you take it out wash it for five minutes before you put it into the eye so today we have uh, the preloaded multifocal or trifocal lenses or multifocal or trifocal um, astigmatic correcting lenses materials have become standard they're available off the shelf advanced manufacturing processes are there engineering has got to be very very precise and with ray tracing technology being available off the shelf to everybody who's manufacturing lenses high quality lenses are available at reasonable prices one should look not at a routine monofocal lens to see the quality you should look at the multifocal or trifocal lens or tri or, or the toric lenses to see the performance of an indian lens vis a vis an important lens again looking at vision and saying yes my patients get 66 and 6 i look at they get intermediate n6 and near n8 that really doesn't quantify a lens. We will look at only the defocus curves. And we look at the MTF values. We look at post-operative aberrations, total aberrations after the lens has gone in. And we look at the rotation stability to say how well these lenses perform. So higher order aberrations in an Indian multifocal eye oil, standard. The preoperative is the corneal aberrations, not the total. And the post-operative is the total aberrations. So do these abrasion correcting lenses really handle the corneal abrasions across the spectrum? Yes, they do. Consistently, the post-op abrasions come down compared to the preoperative. The contrast sensitivity, again, trying to look at it is very, very subjective when you get it off from a patient. It's quite difficult even if you have the best charts. Look at the MTF curves. So the MTF curve of an Indian multifocal eye oil, which is essentially a bifocal, is very close to an imported monofocal eye oil. The gold standard of MTF to give you the best crisp vision would be one that you would get at the monofocal. We'll compare it to the multifocal later. A contrast sensitivity in these remained high postoperatively. We look at the contrast sensitivity or the MTF curves of India's multifocal eye oils from two different companies with the published data of the imported eye oils. They compare very favorably. So that's the, the seat. Let's go one step further, look at the trifocal eye oils. The higher order aberrations definitely came down. That means what is promised as an aberration correcting eye oil, the Indian ones perform, and they do give you low aberrations postoperatively. Higher order aberrations consistently came down, not just in one patient, consistently came down. So they do work, and the aberration correcting profile of these lenses do work. Comparing an Indian trifocal eye oil with an imported monofocal, you see that the MTF curves compare very favorably with the monofocal itself. You compare with a bifocal. When you say multifocal, you should use the word very loosely used. The, the multifocals are truly bifocals. The Indian trifocals perform better than an intern uh, imported bifocal eye oil. I'm comparing here the Indian trifocal with the Zeiss trifocal, which is probably the gold standard today available in our country, performs very well. We look at the defocus curves. Again, this is the acid test for any kind of a multifocal or trifocal eye oil. This is fabulous. The trifocal eye oil really gives you the tail is lifted up there. So you have an almost flat curve, and that's what we look for. That's the holy grail. The day we get this drop also straightened out, and that's the lens that's going to be the ultimate lens to put in the eye. So we're getting there. So to sum up, Indian machines work perfectly well. They are very, very low cost compared to the imported ones. The running cost also is lower. The AMC, CMC is lower. The lenses do perform as, perform as uh, promised at a much lower rate. So we come to the Toric. <coughs> so what do we look at Toric? Does it remain in the bag? Getting it right is the surgeon's uh, prerogative. He has to do it. But does the lens stay there, stay put? So it stayed put after one week and stayed put there after one month. We looked at stability after one month, was very, very good, comparable to the imported lenses. When we compared and looked at it on eye trace, so we had uh, quite a number of uh, lenses that stayed on absolute zero or within one degree. 
and the worst case scenario was a seven degree rotation over a month. So again, to sum it up, Indian FACO machines, Indian eye oils, both multifocal, trifocal, and the toric perform excellently, giving us excellent results. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Burman. I think that's a pertinent question that everybody wants to know. What is the difference between Indian machines and uh, uh, imported ones, and likewise for the lenses? Uh, it is my pleasure now to invite the next speaker, Dr. Arup Chakravarti, who's going to be speaking on preoperative aberrometry to optimize cataract outcomes. Good morning, friends. Uh, all of us cataract surgeons uh, gathered in this room will agree with me that from time to time, we come across patients after cataract surgery or at times before cataract surgery in the 40 to 60 year age group who have 6-6 six, six and 6 vision, but still very symptomatic about their vision. They are not happy with the quality of vision. So I have been, we all of us have been managing this kind of patients for a pretty long time, and it basically boils down to the quality <coughs> of vision. And I have, in the recent past, last couple of months, worked up or assessed these patients using a eye trace aberrometer from the uh, Tracy, com Tracy Technologies company, I have no financial interest, and I hope I, uh, though I have not embarked on any formal study as such, but I would like to share my experiences with you, and I hope the uh, take-home messages or my experiences are of benefit to you. Now, uh, multifocal lenses or trifocal lenses, uh, as Dr. Bay Vasavada has already mentioned, do extremely well, provided you have selected the patient properly, you have taken care to rule out the patients with comorbidities, the contraindications, and they have used the right technology intraocular lens patient. Most of the patients do extremely well. However, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from time to time, we do come across patients where everything seems to be fine, but patient is not at all happy. So this basically is, uh, ex can be explained by an optical alignment issue. And with the eye trace machine, we measure the angle alpha. In, in with reference to cataract surgery, we always talk about angle alpha. So this is the red cross is the visual axis. The blue cross that you see is the uh, center of the limbus. And that is the basically the surrogate of the capsular bag. And when you implant a lens within the capsular bag, it basically centers on the, on the bag, whether regardless of you centers make the uh, uh, optic center on the visual axis because it takes up elastic recoil, it takes up its centration on the bag. So angle alpha definitely is very, very important, this distance. And if the visual axis doesn't cut the central ring of the multifocal lens, the patients uh, may be really symptomatic. So this was a patient where uh, it's a three-piece multifocal lens. I had a PC dent, and I had done a ciliary, uh, the, the sulcus uh, implantation with the posterior optic capture. If you see the central reflexes, they're so well-centered on the central button of, uh, the inter of the multifocal lens, and patient had absolutely no symptoms. So uh, I would like to uh, give you some, exam some clinical examples. For example, this particular patient uh, was desirous of a multifocal lens, but angle alpha was 0 0.633 millimeters in the right eye. So it is uh, much larger than what I would uh, uh, consider a patient suitable for a multifocal lens. The left eye was 0 0.233, so that was okay, but still I decided not to go ahead with multifocal technology in this patient. So if the angle alpha is less than 0 0.5 millimeter and corneal higher order aberration is less than 0 0.2 millimeter, I would uh, consider the patient, if the patient really fits the bill, no contraindications exist for a multifocal lion or a multifocal toric. Now you move on to the next set of uh, uh, category of patients where uh, patients between 40 to 60, they have normal vision in terms of uh, what you measure on the Snellen's acuity, but they have a uh, lot of symptoms, glare, halos, and so contrast is issues, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, I, uh, I would like you to uh, uh, think about this particular paper that was published by George Waring, Diagnosis and Treatment of Dysfunctional Lens Syndrome. So we are basically dealing with eyes which have a dysfunctional lens syndrome. It progresses through three stages. I'm not going to go into the details. So as you work up a patient in this age group with this particular uh, symptoms on the eye trace machine, this is the dysfunctional lens index display. 
there are three things that we're going to focus on. One is the E, uh, the, uh, the, the degree of blur of the E that you see here. This arises from the cornea, this is from the lens, and this is the total eye. Then you look at the dysfunctional lens index bar, look at this number, and finally the total eye opacity map. So again, this is graded from one to five. So this is what I had mentioned. So this is actually the dysfunctional lens in index number. So the lower the num number, it varies from zero to 10, lower the number reduces the visual function. And if it is greener on the color scale, it is the patient is having better vision. And the letter E basically again reflects in the quality of vision. I'll give you certain clinical examples. I'll be talking about these three modalities of uh, the metrics that I use to assess my patients. So I thought it is important that we understand what we are talking about. Then the third, uh, dis the third index that metric that I, I work up is the total eye opacity map, which again is graded from one to five. It doesn't really correspond with the LOCS grading system, but you know, any, any cat if it is grade zero, grade two, grade three, it is a higher degree of lens opacity. So let us uh, see certain case, case scenarios. Now this was a 58 year old nurse from Ireland, diabetic, ocular surface issues, a hyper, uh, hypertensive uh, patient. And she had a 6 6 M6 vision with correction, minimal lens changes. You, if you can see here, the, the, the uh, peripheral changes starting here, um, uh, right eye moved on the left, uh, left eye moved on the right eye. And on dilatation, she had you know, one plus nucleus sclerosis. Now, as I put her on the eye trace, you realize that on the right eye, the, the DLI index is 10, but on the left eye, it is 7.12. And if you, s you see the quantum of blurring of the E, the grading of the lens here was, the opacity grading was 1.0. So I took her up for cataract surgery on the left eye, and she was 6.6 six plano, and she was absolutely happy. Her visual symptoms were gone. Without working up the patient on the eye test machine, I would not have basically the justification for me to proceed with cataract surgery in a patient like that. Now this was another patient, 59 year old main patient with uh, diabetes, came for second opinion. He, sh he had been shopping around because of blurring of vision. 6'6", six, six, N6 six vision, patient cannot tolerate glasses. Minimal lens changes on dilatation, again, nucleus uh, sclerosis grade one, peripheral lens changes. So as I put him on the eye trace machine, again, you see the blurring of the E. This is the internal blurring, it's coming from the lens. This is the right eye. The DLI is 6.82 in, in the right eye, and lens opacity is grade 2.0. On the fellow eye, again, uh, the great opa great opa lens opacity is grade 2.5, and there's a little bit of blurring of the E. So I took him up for cataract surgery in both eyes. Post-operatively, he had a fantastic vision, 6.6 six, 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 and, and uh, plain on the right eye, and with minimal correction, 6.6 six in the left eye. All his symptoms were gone. Again, without the eye test workup, I would not have the courage to proceed with cataract surgery in this patient. This is the third patient who complained bitterly of halos. He had good vision. He was not happy, he was not willing to wear glasses. Two plus nuclear sclerosis. Again, if you see the numbers here, DLI is 3.36 in the right eye and 4.38 in the left eye. Opacity score is 1.5, grade two in the right, left eye and the right eye respectively. I took him up for cataract surgery. And of course, as uh, Dr. Anand had mentioned, we have to have a very good preoperative biometry done and the patient was spot on, 66 six, uncorrected, both eyes, all the symptoms were gone. This was a gynecologist. She uh, had poor vision and she wanted a multifocal technology intraocular lens. She had a vision of 6.6 six N6 six with correction, but uh, very significant uh, DLA lens opacity in index, 2.48 in the right eye, 2.7 in the left eye. So she is a candidate for uh, cataract surgery, but I, opt, uh, I encouraged her to opt out of multi multifocal lens because of the angle alpha. Angle alpha 0 0.532 in, in the right eye. Left eye was okay, so I decided that I just perform monofocal intraocular lens for this patient. So, so on and so forth. We have had patients where, you know, there have been, uh, uh, the patient had a difficulty in, in colors, vision was all right. I took the patient up for surgery and patient has done extremely well. So friends, I would just like to conclude by saying that uh, depending upon the workup results on the eye trace, I have taken a decision to go in and for cataract surgery as soon as the patient was ready for it. I have followed up the patients with just glasses because I didn't have the justification or any, any objective evidence to support my uh, uh, decision for uh, going ahead with cataract surgery. So dysfunctional lens index and opacity index are helpful metrics to work up the quality of vision issues in patients that are 6'6", six, six, N6, six, but unhappy. Thank you so much for your kind attention.
Thank you, Dr. Arup, for that wonderful presentation. The next speaker is none other than Dr. <coughs> Namrata Sharma. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Arup. I would be talking to you about IOCT guided FICO emulsification. <coughs> and there are no financial or proprietary interests. Now, this is just to show what you can see through the intro of OCT simple steps of FICO. So, if this is a bi planner incision, you can actually see the uh, bi planner incision here on the intraop OCT microscope in the same field as the surgeon's own field. And when you uh, make a uniplanar incision, then also you can, s what happened? So when you make a uniplanar incision, then also you can see it. Now, as you do hydro maneuvers, the cortex, which is separated from the nucleus, can also be seen, and also the hydro delineated part of the nucleus. Then, uh, when you do the FACO emulsification, you can actually see the depth of the crater. So, this is useful in hard cataracts when you are uh, making a crater. So, you can see the depth of the the depth at which the crater by looking at the walls of the crater. Then. Uh, uh, at the end of the FACO, when the FACO finishes, then you can actually see the bulge of the <coughs> posterior capsule as you take out the FACO probe. Then uh, when you form the bag with the viscoelastic or the OVD, then you can see that the bag moves down. So it allows you to see the dynamics of the capsule, the nucleus. And uh, when you put the intraocular lens, then notice that there's a gap which is present between the lens and the PC. And after the uh, viscoelastic is aspirated out, then one can also see that this gap would decrease. So uh, uh, sometimes uh, this PC remains stretched, and in some cases, this PC remains crinkly despite the fact that you've removed all the viscoelastic out. And this mainly depends on the white to white uh, measurement of the patient's eye. So the posterior capsule position also can be seen during the, uh, during the time when uh, the uh, viscoelastic is being aspirated from the uh, from behind the lens. <coughs> now, in when you wound, when you hydrate the wounds, you can actually see the spindle of the hydration that occurs in the side port, such as this, and the gaping of the uh, outer wall or the inner wall can also be highlighted. Now, again, in this, the spindle is formed and there is no gape there, and this is the main wound which is being hydrated. But notice, as you hydrate, there is still some amount of gape which is there uh, externally, although not internally. And of course, the spindle does form. And in the end, you can even make out if there are small DMDs, which are there, which are classically present when the wounds are hydrated. So there's a small DMD which is present here. And this can be then addressed with the help of the air bubble uh, injection. Of course, uh, when you don't have IOCT, then you may miss these. And uh, uh, in cases of posterior subcapsular cataract, for instance, you can see that the PC is quite intact here and the, uh, the cataract is only posterior subcapsular, just uh, above the PC. Whereas this case, such as this, this is a posterior polar cataract. Again, you can see that this is merging with the adjacent tissue. Then in cases of white cataracts, this is filled with the, uh, the you can see the black areas. That means it's not completely fluid. And so as uh, the, uh, the capsular excess is being initiated, there's actually a concavity and not a convexity of the fluid. And uh, uh, again, it helps you to predict whether uh, in these cases uh, the Argentinian flap will be present or not. So whenever these fluid clefts are present in between, you know that the Argentinian flap will not occur. And then one and, and, and when, the, when it is not present, then one can take uh, precautions accordingly. Now as the rexis is initiated and the rexis is uh, made, again, one can see the edge of the rexis on the capsule here. And this is very useful when you have corneal haze because if you lose the edge of the rexis underneath the haze, you can actually pick it up by looking at the anterior segment OCT pictures. So uh, now uh, in this case, it is uh, completed. And uh, uh, this is a case of white cataract where you see it is absolutely no uh, black areas present, no fluid clefts present at all. So as you give a nick in the uh, capsule, you can see that the fluid blob comes out. And when you have a, a featureless kind of a, a nucleus like this, uh, then you know that uh, uh, the fluid is going to come out. Now, this is a case of capsular distension syndrome. And notice 
the patient had myopia and the gap between the capsule and the lens can be seen and after that uh, rim of the uh, uh, the uh, anterior capsular fibrosis was removed the ca the lens is sitting bang on the uh, posterior capsule and the post operatively the patient uh, was relieved of the myopia so these subtle things can be uh, picked up by the uh, intraop uh, oct now again again in cases of posterior polar cataract for instance this is a posterior polar cataract again you can you can actually uh, make out what is the uh, what is the uh, relationship between the posterior capsule and the uh, and the overlying uh, cortex in the nucleus and whether any defect is present or not and uh, one can modulate the surgery accordingly now for instance in this case again if you look at the uh, <coughs> posterior pole you can see that there is a gap which is present and uh, so these cases are best uh, dealt only by hydro delineation and hydro dissection should be avoided in these cases so wherever you want to focus you have to get this square uh, the ju the junction of the pink and the green line and it will focus at that particular point in uh, time uh, at that particular point of place so you can you can see that there is a gap and as the nuclear layers are removed you can see that there is a gap a clear gap which can be uh, seen in the area of the posterior pole so uh, one can plan the intraocular lens and the surgery uh, accordingly now this was a case in which there is a, 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 a it's a post pk uh, dsec cataract so you can see that the dsec graft is sitting there and uh, the, the configuration of the wound configuration of the penetrating keratoplasty can also be seen and uh, subsequently uh, the graft does move it's quite you can see that this is a pk wound here and the dsec wound which is at the back and as you do the maneuvers of the uh, cataract surgery the graft moves a little bit because there's a gap present between the dsec graft and the overlying stroma so these uh, subtle things are highlighted which otherwise would not be picked up if we uh, did the surgery without the intraopacity microscope so at the end of the surgery for instance in this case the uh, the end point would be that the graft is completely stuck without any uh, detachments uh, herein so uh, so to conclude intraoperative imaging is useful in cases uh, of routine uh, in in routine cases of phaco emulsification especially in the event of problems it has an additional value in difficult cases such as white cataract and posterior polar cataracts and also in cases of lamellar grafts uh, with the advent of the lamellar surgery which is very much into the vogue and it helps to understand the dynamics of the lens iris in relation to the cornea so thank you for your uh, kind attention uh, dr suhas uh, you are ready sir so the next speaker is uh, dr suhas saldipurkar and he is going to tell us about pc rent and zonular dialysis prevention and management holds the key Good afternoon, and dear Dr. Namrata, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in the company of such august people, and after such, <laughs> <laughs> and and after such uh, uh, lovely, lovely talks, uh, let's go to another set of situations, which also exist, and once in a while, either because of our overconfidence or because of carelessness, we may land up with some of these situations. And there are some situations which you either guess or you know obviously that need to be taken care. But as part of cataract surgeon, as our volume goes up, all these situations do come. And you obviously cannot say no. And those are PCR and zonular uh, dialysis or subluxation. And PCR is something which I think everyone has to live through. Now, what are the predisposing factors for the occurrence of PCR? They could be of multifactorial, they could be patient-related, surgeon-related, intraoperative, or machine or device-related as well. The general, general factors could be extraocular or intraocular. They could, there could be various reasons, it could include a demented patient, a deep set eye, and all those 
or it could be reduced workspace or your uncomfortable position in which you are sitting or it could be eye related. But the surgeon related are either we are inexperienced surgeon or we still need to go through that learning curve or high volume camp surgery. And the most important are intraoperative where either I have formed a, made a small rexis or uh, the rexis has caused a bit of tear or when I'm doing FACO, maybe the fluid imbalance. Now this is a classic example of something I didn't expect to happen, nor you would. A normal hydro, you see that snap sign? And that spells it, you know? Now, what happens as a surgeon when you're operating, you're concentrating somewhere else and your video cannot make that mistake. But by now you know that yes, you are in for disaster, but that was done some years back. Today I would not do it this way. I would stop, inject enough amount of viscoelastic between the rexis and the nucleus to literally load it behind so there's no question of the nucleus dropping and here I'm just waiting for. And then what best can you do? You can only clean up whatever you can and clean up you must because I know by now I'm not like many of these who are also VR trained but I have the, I have the benefits of VR surgeon operating in the next theater. So I just go ahead very meticulously without any uh, you know expressions because patient since he's, everything is closed, his eyes are open. He's, he's, he's listening to everything that you talk or you express. You do your case as normal, put in your lens, obviously a three-piece lens, and if you are fortunate to have done a small rexis, the lens gets captured, and then quietly the, you know, the patient is shifted to the next theater. Now, what are the factors in decision making? It could be the extent of post posterior capsular tear, whether your hyaloid face or intact or no, the location where exactly the nucleus at that time, confidence of the surgeon, and all these things go in to you know, finally give you that end result as normal. When it comes to nucleus or nuclear fragment management, if you have already caused PCR, where, go, where are you going to keep that nucleus till rest of the you know, situation is created? Either you tumble it out, you use different posterior assisted levitation, or if you think it's beyond you, you convert. Now let's look at this case. You know, you have to be attentive. And luckily on that day I was attentive. And I'm sure most of you would always be. Now it's a normal case a normally done hydro dissection, I start with the case and watch it. Now, I had it. Now, why did I have it? That's because my settings were not okay. But then I was watchful. What I do, I come out, rotate the nucleus, get enough amount of viscoelastic, and inject it behind. Now, that is your saving grace. You know, you find the excess, you find the gap, inject viscoelastic, and then best thing you do is use two instrument technique, rotate it out, and get the lens on top of the back. Once your lens is supracapsular, then half your battle is won. Then you have various techniques. Here, in fact, I tumble it, and then inject some more viscoelastic so that I have a nice cushion underneath and above. And then, then thanks to our friend, I also joined the bandwagon of uh, uh, scaffolding. And now you're bold enough because your rexis is intact. Even if the leading haptic is, whether it's in, the, uh, in front of the iris or behind the iris, as long as it is not you know, behind the capsule, I mean behind the tear, you're just okay with it and just go about your FACO in the normal way. And then it's just a matter of routine because it's not a hard nucleus. 
And once you are done with that, based on how much of vitreous is disturbed, how much of cortex is behind, you decide whether you want to go past plana or you want to go from anterior. But one thing you, one should remember that our causing vitrectomy from the anterior approach is not causing more disturbance to that vitreous, which you have already caused it. And a little bit of vitrectomy and I just, uh, you know, one after another can definitely uh, help you come out of this. And finally in this, to cut, cut the time, you know, you, you reach a stage where practically most of your cortex is out and the lens is well centered and that's it. Then we come to the next situation which is uh, uh, zonular weakness. Now one, th one has to remember even before you manage it, what has caused it, how much is the degree of zonular loss, what's the location because that decides where your incision is going to be and presence or absence of vitreous decides the prognosis and the extent of work that you need to do there. And that zonular weakness could present you in various different degrees. It could be just a shallow anterior chamber despite normal axial length. It could be very focal iridogenesis. It could be visibility of peripheral lens equator upon lateral gaze, or it could be as wide as uh, you know uh, a decentered lens. But the principal one must remember is you should cause worsening of the existing defect and if possible, maintain a capsular stability and short term as well as long term. And we know that we use all these different devices, intraocular devices for doing it. And timing and choice of insertion is also important, like the hooks at all will can be inserted even before completion, whereas CTR can only be put after it. When it comes to incision, it has to be 90 degrees away from the place of uh, weakness and the rexis has to be begun with a sharp tip because as it is the, new ca the entire uh, um, uh, cataract uh, is unstable. <coughs> when it comes to choice of capsular bag support based on degree and you know how uh, uh, nicely you have done it, either it can be done enough with CTI alone or it could be a scleral fixation or uh, various ways of fixing the lens. Now this is a situation where uh, the, the defect looks quite huge, but the saving grace for me right from the beginning, even before I started, was there was no phacodonesis. It was long standing, but there was a lot of anterior capsular fibrosis, so I had to do rexis either with uh, Zepto or with Femto. Zepto suits me. And the reason you do that is with, with anterior capsular fibrosis, doing rexis even in a normally supported capsular bag is difficult. In such cases, it's more difficult. And then, once and fortunately the nucleus wasn't hard, so once the ECR is in, and um, the, the bag uh, quite looks stable, and with the lens in, you know, it takes normal position. At the most, what you do is, because of that chromatic midriasis, you may take one, um, you know, uh, this, I'm done. Okay, uh, with one uh, pupiloplasty suture, your pupil is come well in it. I'll only take half a minute, ma'am. Now this is an extensive uh, weakness and uh, subluxation where there's vitreous as well uh, in the uh, anterior chamber. First thing you do is to do anterior vitrectomy, start your excess away, and then even before anything else <laughs> done further, do a copious hydrodissection, free the nucleus from the back, and if possible, free the epinucleus and the cortex from the back and in your, put in your uh, hooks. And after that, maybe this is a stage when you do a rehydro mm. and then uh, put in your uh, endocapsular ring. But that's not enough because this bag has got severe phacodonesis and that's a time when, okay, I'm done. Uh, then you come uh, by way one of the various different techniques. We here I'm using Hoffman and then there are different ways in which, and in this case, you, you'll see me using uh, Amos segment with the convexity out, and once the bag is fixed, you will uh, put a lens, and uh, that's it. And uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, in conclusion, I'll tell you when everything you think has gone right, it's, it's uh, 10 seconds, man. Uh, everything seems to be okay, and the patient has got trifocal in one eye, the second eye is getting trifocal, and wa look what happens. So that means, 
you cannot be sure till you have left the theater or the patient has left the theater. The lens is about to go into a inflated vac. The cartridge gets stuck. So surgeon tries to get the lens back and forth, creates suction, and the entire bag is sucked up. So with this, what I wish to tell you is, uh, nothing is complete uh, till the patient has gone out of the bed and out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those wonderful videos, uh, Dr. Suhas. And now it is my pleasure to invite the next speaker, the final speaker uh, for the symposium. Uh, none other than Dr. Amar Agarwal, who's going to be speaking on secondary IOLs and transcleral haptic fixation is the new paradigm. Thank you very much, Dr. Namrata, and all of the people on the panel for inviting me here. So let's see, this patient was a subluxated cataract. I've tried to fix an endocapsular ring inside, but notice the problem in this case was basically this. While removing that, I did not have the Sioni ring, and the fragment went in. This was a VIP patient who had flown long distance and wanted a multifocal IUL. And here I produced a rent, I produced a drop nucleus, and on top of that my endocapsule ring was also going in, so I tried to pull it out fast. Now my next problem is, as I told you, the patient wanted a multifocal IUL. So I've done triamcinolone injection now here. I made my scleral flaps. The next step is to do a vitrectomy. Remember there's a small fragment inside also. So before I go in to do my glued IOL surgery there, I thought first let's remove this lens fragment which is removed there, you can see. Now remember the glued IOL if you're doing, you need a three-piece IOL and for a multifocal IOL, there's just one company which creates that and that's the AMO or the J&J lens. So these lenses are three-piece lenses and can be used for gluing the lenses inside. The advantage here is you can see the first haptic out now I'll do the handshake technique and I can do the second haptic out. As I said, the basic advantage is you are creating a multifocal glued IOL. You can fix those rings where you want it. Remember that. If you put it in a bag, you can't tell where the ring is going to be. But in this case, I can tuck, untuck, depending on where I want my ring to be. And that's the advantage in this. Now look at another patient. This was sent to me by Kapil Vora, one of the top surgeons from Haryana. You know the Haryana Express. And this was a VIP patient he referred to me. But look at that, small pupil. And what I wanted to show you is, he had a large white to white eye. I've done a small iridectomy in the area of the scleral flap so that I can come more anterior. Please, when you're doing this, don't go posterior. Go 0.5 to 1 millimeter from limbus. I've dilated the pupil. Now with the iris oaks, catching that lens, and what's inside? A multifocal, decentered eye well. Now again, you see, I've caught the haptic there. Then I'm going to do the handshake technique. Shift from one hand to the other, one hand to the other, one hand to the other. Keep on till you see the tip of the haptic. Catch, pull, game, set, and match. So. Once you have caught that tip of the haptic with the handshake technique, you're through. Now, once I have done that, see again, I'm going to transfer it from one hand to the other, catch the tip of the haptic, pull out. Once you have done that, again, what am I going to do? I'm going to do a multifocal glued IOL, but in this case, an existing IOL which is inside. Now, remember, I had come anteriorly, I told you 13 millimeter eye, but look at the amount of haptic externalized. It's a lot. This lens, there is no way it will dislocate. But the problem is when you come anteriorly, you can get an optic capture, as you can see there. In case, nothing. Just do single pass, fourth row, pupil velocity, and I'm going to solve my optic capture on spot, on table. Another big advantage when I do this is the patient will never have any positive dysphotopsia. Remember, if you have a patient with positive dysphotopsia or something like that, you can do a pinhole pupil velocity and your patient will have distance and near without glasses. In this case, you can see now, I fixed a trocar AC maintainer. All I do is remove it and I have now a decentered multifocal IOL fixed. What about the Shin Yamane technique? Shin is here in India now, right now for the conference. Great technique. The reason I don't use, to be honest, is for the simple reason I feel there's a tilt in it. 
But if you want to do it, this is a technique which we have started and published in the JCRS. Watch it carefully, there's slightly difference here because in India you don't get the Zeiss lenses which go through 30 gauge needles. So you're using a J&J lens, bringing the flange out. Now watch the trick which I learned from a Japanese surgeon and I combine that with this, doing the flange, but watch this, the next step is I'm going to rivet it. Like they did it for the aerodialysis technique. By the riveting technique, so in other words, I'm doing a riveting flange technique and using the handshake technique. So the advantage of the handshake technique now is, now I pass my needle inside and I lock it inside there. So the advantage here is you don't have both the needles inside the eye, which I think is dangerous for the retina. Once I've brought it on, I've created my flange. Now watch, create the rivet. That will make it broader so that the haptic will not go down. Saying that if you want to do the shins technique, it's a great technique here. I don't do it because I see compared to the glued aisle, to be honest, I see more of a tilt in this. Now let's take this difficulty to the next level. This patient was referred to me by the president of AIOS, just previous one was Dr. Natarajan. You can see this patient was operated six times, okay? The reason I'm showing you this for ISHF is basically, can you do it in such crazy cases? See the bad scarred cornea, and this patient has come from Bombay, wanted to commit suicide, so when Nutty called me up and sent the patient to me, I asked him to send the patient over. I tried to go ahead, fix my trocar AC maintainer, made my flaps, and look at how bad the stuff of the scarred tissue of the endothelium is. It is so badly scarred that I'm going to now catch it and use a scissor to cut it. The reason again I'm showing you this is, if you will try to do, let's say a sutured IOL in a case like this, you are going to struggle to even visualize. And if that's the big message which I want to show you. Another big message in this case is, cases like this, you don't want any pseudophacodonesis. See how bad that scar is? I'm cutting it off there. I'm using an endometer from outside to see even then I am struggling. But now watch, you will see when I remove this little bit of scar tissue which is massively present there, you see something moving inside the eye. And what is moving inside the eye? Look at that, something coming into picture there. That is a subluxated, nearly dislocated eye. I didn't do that, that was there before. Okay, I was just touched the cornea till now. So catch it anywhere. I caught the haptic somewhere. Now I don't want this eye to go down. All I do is catch it anywhere, now transfer it from one hand to the other. And you can see me doing it. I don't know where I caught it, I don't care. I'm going to just transfer it now from one hand to the other till I find my tip. Once I find the tip of the haptic, I will pull it out and externalize it. Now I'm safe, at least this lens doesn't go down. Now, one haptic out, game not over, ladies and gentlemen. So now what I'm going to do is I've got to catch the second fellow there. So. I'm doing some more vitrectomy because now I'm comparatively safer. Catch it anywhere, I can't find it. Okay, see, I'm not seeing it anywhere. I'm using the movement of the lens haptic a little bit to give me some light visualization, caught. Catch it anywhere, now I'm safe. Again, handshake technique. So remember, you need two forceps, two glutial forceps to transfer from one hand to the other. Catch the tip, remember. If it's your tip of the finger, you can pull it out. You bring it out from the middle of the flange, your finger will break. Game over. Look at the amount of haptic externalize. If I tuck that amount of haptic, there is no way for the next 100 years that lens is going to dislocate. Once I have done that, just to cover up this final uh, clipping here is, I'm going to close up this pupil. Why? Closed angle will become open angle. Two, the air remains in the anterior chamber. Three, I've created something like a pinhole pupillosity, so any astigmatic problem will also get neutralized. So you see now the final picture which I'm going to show you here is, I'm just going to do this fourth row pupillosity, get this thing down and bring that pupil down. Once the pupil is down, just to show you at the end of this case, I'll just show you here how I will end this case just on a completion case. Here you can see the simple pass and in the next session, I have my FACO nightmare session just following this, in which I'll be discussing more to you on various complications like this. But to close up this particular video, which I wanted to show you, you can see I've made it a small, look at the Perkinji image, P1, it's bang centered. My visual axis and pupillary axis are bang on line and together. So end of the day, all I need to do is just take off the remaining endothelium, most of it I had already removed, 
take the PDEC graph. We never do DSEC, we never do DMEC. We take only PDEC in our center there. And you can see the final picture here, which I'm just going to show you in a second. I'm just taking this PDEC graph, which has got the endothelium desmase and the pre-desmase layer injected inside. And as I just said, for com completion's sake, let's see how this patient looked at the end after intrascular haptic fixation, where we have done the glued dial, we did the vitrectomy, we did the fourth ropeplasty, and ended it with PDEC. You see the five fibrin glue being applied, sealing everything down, and the last clipping, which I'm just showing you in the last 10 seconds, that's pre-operative, ladies and gentlemen. Six times operated, came from Bombay, pre-operative, post-operative, 15 days post-op, and the final picture, which we will show you now, is 45 days post-op, and you can see the massive difference from the pre-op to the post-op. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amar, for that excellent presentation and excellent video. Uh, I think there is no time for discussion now, and we move on to the next session. I would like to thank all the uh, speakers uh, who, who presented so well and all the delegates who came to attend this national symposium on cataract in FECO in, in, in the next millennium. Thank you so much.